Hi everybody, so this is the second video associated with chapter 3 of the course. So in this chapter we introduced what we call the Black-Scholes model where the dynamics of the underlying asset of a, a given derivative is driven by what we call a geometric Brownian motion. And uh, in the last class we discussed that uh, derivatives could be priced with a formula that it that is analogous to what we signed chapter 2 which is that the price of some option is the expected discounted payoff of the option or of the derivative but where the expectation it's not it's not taken under the true physical measure but rather under some uh, measure which is called a risk neutral measure and under which the dynamics of the underlying asset is slightly different in our case, going from the physical measure to the risk neutral measure and tell that the, uh, the underlying asset still has the same uh, geometric Brownian motion dynamics with the same volatility, but the only change is that the parameter mu under the physical measure, which is the average growth rate, is replaced to R minus uh, delta uh, or I mi R minus Q which is the risk rate minus the dividend yields of the, uh, the underlying asset under the risk neutral measure Q. Okay, so this is the pricing formula, but now why was this formula holding? Well, we didn't go into details because the theory is quite uh, involved in our uh, continuous time setup, but we said that the risk neutral valuation formula uh, worked because of this uh, replicating portfolio scheme that we've studied a bit in chapter 2 so in this continuous time model it's still possible to construct replicating portfolio for derivatives which are self-financing portfolios whose terminal value is equal to the payoff of the derivative with probability 1 and the value of that replicating portfolio could be found or can be fined with that uh, risk neutral evaluation formula okay and due to the absence of arbitrage the law of one price entails that the price of the derivative must be the price of the replicating portfolio which is given by the risk eval uh, risk neutral evaluation formula so now this is true for um, general derivatives we're going to see how to apply this to the case of uh, european options to find formulas for their prices okay so we're going to assume now that we want to price uh, european options through the methodology we outlined in the previous lecture so the Ur european call option its payoff payoff has the following form so the payoff uh, evaluated at s capital t at the terminal value of the underlying asset at capital T which is the maturity of the option is equal to maximum between 0 and S capital uh, T minus K okay so we will show steps for a call option but for a put option uh, similar steps could be followed to derive a for formula okay so now we know that we can apply the risk neutral evaluation formula so we we will apply this formula and uh, obtain an explicit expression for the price of a call option in the Black-Scholes model. Okay, so here assume we are at time small t and we want to price an option maturing at time capital T. So the time to maturity of the option, which is the maturity uh, minus the current date, is going to be denoted by tau in what follows. Okay, so the price of the option at time small t if we use the risk neutral valuation formula it's the this is the discount factor between small t and capital T times the expected value under the risk neutral measure of the payoff of the call option given the current information at time t okay so now this is uh, the risk neutral evaluation formula how do we go from here to here well, this expresses uh, the stock or underlying asset value at time capital T from 
the underlying asset value at time small t. Okay, so we saw uh, in the previous lecture that we can express the time capital T price as the time small t price times the exponential of here. This is the uh, the, the deterministic, deterministic term in the evolution of the stock price times t, uh, capital T minus T plus the increment of the Brownian motion under the risk neutral measure times sigma. Okay, so if this step to go from here to here is not clear, I propose to stop the video and go back to the lecture, uh, the previous lecture for this chapter and show that this is true. So this, this is good. Now how do we go uh, from the second line to the third line? Well, here are two things. Okay, so assuming uh, we're, we know the information at time t, then st is a observable or known quantity, so can, we can treat it as a constant when uh, calculating this expectation. And furthermore, so st we can treat it as a constant, and furthermore, the increment of the Brownian motion under Q, we saw uh, through properties of the Brownian motion that this increment is independent from everything that happened uh, before time small t. So before time small t, uh, the information available is all increments of the Brownian motion before time small t. So increments before time small t and after time uh, small t are independent. So for this reason, this uh, conditioning can be dropped and we can obtain an unconditional expectation in that case where the unconditional distribution of this increment is a uh, normal with mean zero and variance uh, tau so capital T minus small t okay so for that reason because st is known by time t and this Brownian motion increment uh, is independent from the information at time t and normally distributed we can get from uh, to this line here so here this expectation we integrate over possible values of this increment so we integrate uh, so this is the same formula here that is replaced here this increment here is denoted by y here so y is the difference between the well the increment of the cube round in motion here and what is the density of y here in that case? The density of y is the density of a normal with mean zero and variance tau here, okay? Because this is the distribution of the increment. Okay, so this is how we get to here. Now to go from the third line to the fourth line, what we do is a change of variable. Okay, so we make the change of variable y is equal to square root of tau x. So here, to go from here to here, it's only a change of variable. Please verify the steps, but uh, this is stuff you can do from if you followed uh, like regular calculus class, so we won't spend more time on this. And then, uh, so here we're, we have this integral to evaluate, and this integral involves this term here, the maximum between zero and a second term. So this term here, it's worth zero when the second term is smaller than zero, or it's worth the second term when the second term is greater than zero. Okay, so for all values of x when this second term is negative, this whole thing becomes zero and that portion of the integral is zero. Okay, so we have to determine uh, for what values of x this second term here is not zero and is uh, positive. Okay, so this second term here, we take it, we paste it here. So we want to know when is the, the maximum between zero and this second term uh, equal to zero or different than zero. So it's equal to zero if only and only if this second term, as we said, is smaller or equal to zero. And then what we can do here, we can simply isolate the x in this expression so if we do that, we can get to here and here. So this is true if and only if x is smaller or equal to this value here, okay? So when x is smaller or equal to this value, this maximum above is zero and the integral over this interval is zero, okay? 
So if we go back here, the integral over r can be uh, replaced by the integral over all values of x such that this term here is not zero. So we can do that. Okay, and we um, okay. So we we will do that. Okay. So here, if we go back to here, we can take this integral here, copy, paste it. So we can paste it here, and then we said that the integral over r can be uh, expressed as in the integral over values of x for which. Uh, this second term here is greater than zero. So this second term is greater than zero if uh, x is greater or uh, is greater than this quantity empty, which is defined as follows. So if we go back here, this quantity here, uh, which uh, uh, for which x, when x is below that quantity, then the maximum between the two terms is zero then this guy we can define it as empty. So this maximum between zero and this other quantity, it's greater than zero if and only if x is greater than empty. So we can simply integrate over that domain because when x is smaller or equal to t, the uh, interior of the integral is zero. And now here uh, we're integrating with respect to x. So uh, here what we can do here, we see that the first term is a difference between two terms. So, so we have this term here and this term here. So we can separate the entire integral by a difference of integrals. So it's the integral of this term times the density minus k times the density. Okay, so this is go what we do to go from here to here. We just express the integral of the difference as a difference of integrals. And furthermore, for the first term, uh, the some values can be taken out in front of the integral because they're constant with respect to x. Okay, so if we look at the first term here, x only appears in sigma square root of tau x. So this first uh, quantity here, st times the exponential of this guy, can be taken out in front of the integral here like this. So what remains to be done is simply to evaluate both uh, these two integrals here, okay? So, um, so this is what we will do. Okay, just one quick property of the uh, CDF of a normal 0, 1 distribution. Due to the symmetry of the normal 0, 1 distribution, we have the following formula. So the probability uh, ran, a normal 0, 1 random variable is smaller or equal to x is equal to 1 minus the probability it is smaller to minus x. Okay, so if we draw a little picture here, we can see that uh, easily. So here, this is the normal 0, 1 curve here. Sorry, it's not very symmetric in my picture, but in, in practice, it should be more. Oops, maybe okay, I'll draw a better one. Let's say this is symmetric here. So the probability probability to be in this region must be equal to the probability of being in this region here. Okay, assuming this is minus x and this is x. Okay, so my picture is not very good, but assume that this curve is symmetric around the vertical line. Okay, so because of that, we have this property about the normal 0, 1 distribution. Okay. Furthermore, we're going to define some quantities here. So we, can, we will define d1 being log. So this is just the definition. There is nothing to understand here. So d1 is a log of st over k plus r minus q point plus 0.5 sigma square tau divided by sigma square root of tau. Okay, so this is a definition. Uh, now, right now it doesn't make sense, but we're going to see after uh, why we, we need to define this. And we can define d2 being d1 minus uh, sigma square root of tau. Okay, so just some suitable constants we're going to use later on. Okay, so if we go back to the previous slide, uh, the second integral here was the integral 
uh, whenever x is greater than this uh, constant empty, or, well, not this constant, but this value of empty. So this is just 1 minus the CDF evaluated in empty. Okay, so this integral here is 1 minus the CDF in empty. And through the property we've outlined above here, this is just the CDF of minus empty. And if you look at the formula for empty, again, maybe pause the video, go back to the formula of empty. If you uh, take minus empty, you can show, so again, to convince yourself, please pause the video here and make this calculation, but you can show that minus empty is equal to the D2 here that we've uh, calculated or defined here. Okay, so this second integral here can be expressed as the CDF of a normal 0, 1 evaluated in D2. Okay, so going back here, this, eval this gives the formula of this integral. Now what's left is evaluating the first integral here. So to evaluate this first integral, uh, the approach we're going to do is what we call completing the square. So probably in your probability class, you, you've used some technique for some problems already. So here uh, in the second integral, uh, the first integral, sorry, what we had to compute is this integral. So now to go from here to here, this is where we use the uh, complete the square technique. Okay, so again, take your time to verify these steps slowly at home. But the idea here is that this square here can be written as x2 minus 2 sigma square root of t tau, sorry, tau plus sigma square tau. Okay, we can add the divided by, by 2 here. Okay, so here this and the minus sign in front. So here, this uh, minus x square plus sigma square root of tau. It's here also. It's minus x square. If if we cancel the, out the, the the twos and the minuses, this is plus sigma square root of tau. And here we have added plus sigma square tau over two. But uh, here we when we there's a minus sign this is minus this quantity this is why we needed to add back this quantity here to obtain here okay so to go from here to here it's simply a like tedious algebra uh, using a, comp a technique called completing the square okay so I'll let you verify this at home slowly okay so now this is how we went from here to here. Now to go from here to here, what do we do? It's simply a change of variable. So x minus sigma square root of tau, we call it z. Okay, so for this reason, this quantity here becomes z. Uh, dx is equal to dz because both are like x. x is a constant plus z. Okay, and uh, finally, when x is greater than mt, it means that z is greater than mt minus sigma uh, square root of tau. So this is why the boundary of the integral changes here. And this exponential, because it's a constant, we can take it in front of the integral. So it now uh, goes here. And this is the integral for all values of z greater than mt minus square root of uh, tau of the PDF of a normal 0, 1 random variable. Okay, so this expression here, it's 1 minus the CDF of a normal 0, 1 evaluated at this quantity here, which is mt minus sigma square root of tau. Then through the symmetry property of the CDF of a normal 0, 1, we can have that this guy, 1 minus phi of this guy, is phi of minus this guy, and minus this guy is sigma square root of tau minus mt. And this guy here, again, if we, uh, you can pause the video and do the calculation to convince yourself this is true. But here, d1, it can be shown to be equal to sigma square root of tau minus mt. So we can 
plug in the empty we've uh, defined earlier and then sigma square root of tau minus empty is equal to d1. Okay, so this first integral here uh, appearing in the, the price of a call option can be exp can be written as exponential of zero, uh, 0.5 sigma square tau times phi d1 where phi here it's the normal 0 1 CDF. Okay, so collecting all the previous results together we obtain a formula for the price at time t of a European call option. So if we collect all the, the results together, so we replace the integrals by the values we've calculated, we obtain the following formula. Okay, so the price of a call option at time t, a European call option, this is equal to st, exponential of minus the dividend rate times the, divi yeah, dividend rate times the time to maturity times phi of d1, where phi is the normal phi is the normal 0, 1 CDF, minus the strike uh, times the discount factor times phi d2 here, where d1 and d2 are defined according to the following constants. Okay, so this gives a formula for the price at time small t of a European uh, option under this model. And uh, this formula is very famous because, because it's called the Black-Scholes formula based on the name of, of people who designed the, the, the Black-Scholes model. So, uh, yeah, this formula is very, very, very famous in option pricing, uh, the option pricing literature. Okay, so we're, we've, we're done. We've priced a European call option. Now, can we do the same for a put option? The answer is yes. Okay, so the long answer is we can do exactly all the same steps that we did before, uh, replacing the payoff of a call by the payoff of a put option, and we could get another formula for the put option. Okay, so this is feasible, but it's very, very long. Uh, but there's a quicker way to obtain the price of a European put option which is by using the put call parity. Okay, so recall th that the put call parity has the following form. It says that the price of a call at time t minus the price of a put at time t, okay, so we'll put time t, should be equal to st exponential of minus q tau minus k exponential of minus r tau minus the discounted strike. Okay, so here in the Black-Scholes model we've obtained a formula for the price of a call and we can subtract here this term and this term to obtain a value for the price of the put. Okay, so you can we can simply uh, isolate the price of the put in this put call parity equation and substitute CT for the formula we uh, derived uh, in the last, last few slides and from this we can obtain a formula for the price of a put option which is the following it can be shown that the price of a put option is the discounted strike price times phi of minus d2 where d2 was defined uh, earlier in the previous slide minus the stock price times the exponential of minus the dividend rate times the time to maturity times phi of minus d1. Okay, so the formal proof for this, uh, I, I leave it up to you to do as an exercise, but as we mentioned, it's a direct consequence of the put call parity. Okay, now uh, we've considered continuous dividends in that chapter. One question that we might ask ourselves is what happens if there are discrete dividends? So if there are discrete dividends, can we obtain a black uh, formula analogous to the Black-Scholes one we've uncovered uh, in the last few slides? 
The answer is yes. So we won't, again, we won't go into the details because it would be quite cumbersome, but I'll simply give you the result instead. So to obtain the formula for the price of an option when the stock uh, provides with discrete dividends, we simply have to replace ST times the exponential of minus Q tau, the dividend rates time the time to maturity, by the present value of all dividends paid by the option. Okay, so PV small t capital T div, it's defined as the present value at time small t of all the dividends paid by the stock until capital T. Okay, so for example, in the discrete dividends case, uh, if there are uh, dividends at times uh, tau t1 until ti, then the present value of such dividends it's, is the sum for all dividends i of the discount factor between time small t and time i, which is the time at which the dividend is paid, times the dividend paid at ti. So if we uh, consider this, then we can obtain a formula for the price of an option under discrete dividends, where here the only thing that changes is that this term, which was st exponential of minus uh, q tau, it's replaced by st minus the present value of dividends. So here and here in the formula. So if we do that, we can obtain exactly uh, an analogous formula for the price of options under this model. Okay, so same for the put price here. We've given the call price, but if you want a formula for the put price, you can use the put call parity and presence of dividends to derive a formula for the, the put price. Okay, so that's good. Now we know how to find the price of an option in our black Scholes market. And we said that the price of an option at a given time t is the value at that time t of some replicating portfolio. Okay, so there exists a portfolio which can uh, provide, which can have a terminal value equal to the option payoff with probability one, and this portfolio is self-financing. Okay, so now this risk-neutral evaluation formula it gives us the value of the replicating portfolio, but in practice, uh, we might be interested not only in the value of the replicating portfolio, but also in its composition. So we might be interested in knowing how many shares of stocks and how many shares of the risk-free asset are within the replicating portfolio at a given time point. And the reason why is we might be interested in setting up uh, this replicating portfolio in some circumstances and uh, attempt replicating the value of the option. Okay, so. <clears throat> For that replicating portfolio, what is the breakdown between the uh, shares of risky asset and the shares of the risk-free asset? That's a good question. In chapter two, we made calculations for this, but in chapter three, we haven't discussed yet what's the composition of that replicating portfolio. Okay, so how can we uh, determine this? Again, we won't work out the theory because it's pretty involved, but we're, we'll only simply give the result here. Okay, so the price of a derivative at time small t when the current price of the underlying asset is S, for which, and we're going to assume that the payoff of the derivative is phi of S capital T. So here, F small t s is the price at time t of that derivative when the underlying asset is worth s currently. Then it can be shown that the number of risky asset shares in the replicating portfolio must be equal to that quantity. Okay, so maybe to be more exact, that quantity should be the derivative of the price of the option where when the uh, with respect to the underlying asset value when the underlying asset value is equal to its current value okay so if we have a pricing function for a derivative uh, we can simply differentiate this function with respect to s the current value of the underlying asset and this is the number of shares found in the risky asset 
for their replicating portfolio. Okay, so this number of shares often in practice is called the delta of the option. So the delta of an option is the partial derivative of an option price with respect to the value of its underlying asset. Okay, so a bit of terminology. The action of neutralizing the risk related to a short option position by buying delta underlying asset shares is called is a procedure called delta hedging. Okay, so what do we mean by neutralizing the risk? Well, we, we're going to discuss that a bit more uh, subsequently. But the idea is that uh, if you hold an option or if you have a short position on some option, then you can set up a replicating portfolio by purchasing uh, delta shares of stock. And then the uh, changes of value of your short position will be offset by the changes in value of your replicating portfolio. So this is what we mean by neutralizing the risk. And because setting up the portfolio entails buying delta shares of the risk-free asset, where delta is given by this formula here, this formula is called, uh, this approach is called delta hedging. So delta hedging means we buy delta shares of asset in some portfolio uh, which is exactly the number of asset shares which we, which is found is the, in the replicating portfolio. Okay, so now we just said that if we want to obtain a replicating portfolio, that portfolio should have delta shares of the asset at all time t. But the problem is that this number delta continuously varies through time. So if we go back here, delta is the partial derivative of the option price with respect to the stock price. But as time uh, passes by, the since f is a, a function of time and of the underlying asset, which varies randomly, okay, and time which varies through time, of course, then the delta here is not a fixed number. It's a number that varies continuously. So your composition of the replicating portfolio is something that fluctuates randomly continuously through time. Okay, so in, in, in practice, it's impossible to re rebalance the uh, composition of a portfolio in continuous time. So rebalancing a portfolio must be done at discrete time points. Okay, so in practice, uh, does the replicating portfolio exist? No, because it's impossible to trade in continuous time and uh, always have exactly delta shares of the risky asset in your portfolios. So in, in practice, uh, institution which apply, which attempt designing replicating portfolios, they only consider a discretized version of such portfolio. So a discretized version of what we call delta hedging. Okay, so in practice, replicating portfolios don't perfectly exist because you cannot trade continuously to have delta shares of stock in your portfolio all the time. So in practice, it's only an approximation of reality. Furthermore, another point here, this model, which we considered in this chapter, does not consider transaction costs. Okay, so when you have transaction costs, if you trade continuously, these costs will be very Hi. So this would uh, make continuous time rebalancing, uh, which would be needed to set up a replicating portfolio, it would make them that uh, very prohibitive. So in practice, replicating portfolios cannot be implemented perfectly. So it, they're uh, a good approximation of what we, well, good, that's up to discussion, but at least they're an approximation of the theoretical replicating portfolio illustrated uh, in the theory. Okay, now we're going to discuss a bit some risk management. So we saw that in the Black-Scholes model, the price of an option at some point in time is, well, at least a European option, is a function of six parameters. So according to the Black-Scholes formula, you need the f following six inputs to price 
an, an option, European option in the market, you need the current price of the underlying asset. You need to know its strike price. You, know, you need to know the risk-free rate, the dividend yield of the underlying asset, the time to maturity of the option, and the underlying asset volatility sigma. Okay, so therefore, under the Black-Scholes market uh, model, we can write that the price at time t of an option is some function c of the underlying asset price, the strike, the risk free rate, the dividend uh, yield, the time to maturity, and the underlying asset volatility. Okay, so this gives us the value of an option uh, according to our model. But when we do risk management, we would like to know how would the value of our of these options vary if some of the input values vary. Okay, so for example, we might be interested in knowing uh, if the volatility increases by one person, how much uh, money will we uh, gain or lose on our set of position on options. Okay, so this is in risk management, you assume that things will change in the future and you want to know how by how you will impact be impacted by such changes. Okay, so to calculate the change uh, in value of options when the input values change, typically this is done through partial derivatives of the option value with respect to its input. Okay, so partial derivatives, they're a linearization of the variation of the option price with respect to uh, values of the uh, input parameters. So they're, uh, they're well fitted to, uh, to answer this question, which is by how much will my option price vary if some input value varies. <laughs> okay, so these partial derivatives, which are often referred to as Greeks or Greek letters in the fin uh, mathematical finance literature. So these partial derivatives, they can be used within some Taylor approximations to uh, approximate the variation of option prices when some of the input uh, varies. So for example, we might be interested to know um, uh, to or in the following situation, we can assume that some input current value is x0, and we'd like to know uh, what would be the new price of the option if this input uh, becomes x instead of x0. So in that case, you could uh, use, for example, a first-order Taylor approximation or a second-order Taylor approximation uh, to obtain a representation or at least approximate representation of the new option price uh, based on th these variations of the input value. Okay, so here first order Taylor approximation, it says that the new value of the option would be the old one plus the partial derivative of the option price with respect to the input which varies evaluated at the initial value of the input times the variation of the input. Okay, second order. It's exactly the same formula, but you add a second order term. You add one half times the uh, se second order partial derivative of the option price, with uh, evaluated at the initial value of the input, times the squared variation of the input. Okay, so these Greek letters they allow approximating new prices of options uh, from original prices if there are some shocks in inputs. And then the only thing that need to be calculated in this formula uh, are the partial derivatives here of prices of the option with respect to uh, x, which where x is any input of the pricing formula. OK, so for example, one uh, critical question is what happens uh, to the option price if the value of the underlying asset changes. Okay, so here uh, we can use the following Taylor approximation uh, to approximate the variation of the call option price. So let's say the underlying asset value goes from S to S plus delta. Then 
uh, the variation of the call option price based on the second order Taylor approximation it should be here the partial derivative with respect to the underlying asset times uh, the variation of the underlying asset here which is Delta plus one half times the second partial derivative with respect to the underlying asset times the variation of the underlying asset price squared. Okay, so these Taylor approximations, they, uh, they are good when the vari variation of parameters is not too large. Okay, so if delta is small here, th then this approximation should be very reasonable. But if delta is very large here, so if shocks on inputs are uh, very large, then these Taylor approximations, they become, they might become imprecise. Okay, so these values typically work when uh, shocks on pricing inputs are small. So here in what follows, we're going to present several of the Greeks, uh, which are often used in practice to, uh, to quantify variation of option prices uh, based on input uh, input value variations. Okay, so the first partial derivative is, is the one we discussed earlier. It's called the delta of the option. The delta of the option measures uh, the variation of the option price with respect to the variation of the underlying asset. And for this, uh, for, 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 so when we use the Black-Scholes model, we can substitute C here by the closed form formula we had, and then we can make some calculus. So this is an exercise within the exercise list, but this partial derivative here, we can obtain this closed form uh, for its value. So this first formula for a call option, this second formula for a put option. Okay, so. There also exists an explicit formula for the delta of a European option in the Black-Scholes market. Okay, here, uh, so here this, the delta is the uh, first order partial derivative of the option price with respect to the underlying asset. Then the gamma is the second partial or second order partial derivative of the option price with respect to the underlying asset. Okay, so gamma here is a second order partial derivative with respect to the underlying asset price. Second order partial derivative is the first order partial derivative of the first order partial derivative. So this is the partial derivative of the delta with respect to the underlying asset. So here we can replace delta with the formula above and we obtain, we can also obtain here a closed form solution of the gamma of an option. And it turns out that the formula is exactly identical both for a call and a put option, which is uh, convenient. Okay, so here one quick detail. Here you have capital Phi. So capital Phi here is the CDF of a standard normal distribution, whereas here the small Phi is the PDF and not the CDF. Okay, so this is the density of a normal zero one distribution. Okay. Third Greek uh, found in practice or encountered in practice is theta. So theta is the variation or time decay of the price of an option with respect to the underlying asset. Okay, so we saw that when you have an option, uh, the option value is increasing with respect to the maturity. We saw that result in uh, chapter one. Okay, but it's increasing, but the question is by how much? Okay, so here uh, this um, variation with respect to time uh, often it can well it can be expressed alternatively as follows: it's minus the partial derivative of option prices with respect to time to maturity. Okay, so as time increases, the time to maturity decreases by the same amount. Okay, so here again, you can replace the value of the call option or the option by its explicit formula found in the Black-Scholes uh, framework. And then you would get the following formula either for a call option or this formula for a put option. Okay, so deriving this formula, 
it's nothing very complicated but it's very tedious okay so you can give it a try if you want it's not mandatory so it's ju just like simple differentiation and algebra but the, the the calculations can be a bit cumbersome okay fourth greek letter is rho rho is defined as the variation of the underlying asset with respect to the risk-free rate okay so here uh, the we again we can find closed form solutions for uh, this Greek under the Black Scholes model. Uh, so the, the the Greek letter is assumed to be the partial uh, uh, again its definition is partial derivative of the option price with respect to the risk rate, and we can see that this variation is uh, strictly positive for a call option and strictly negative for a put option. Okay, so when interest rates increase the value of a call option increases but the value of a put option decreases okay another greek letter here is the vega of the option just a quick note here vega is not a true greek letter okay so it's an invented greek letter there's no such greek letter called vega it's the people they took a name which looks like a Greek letter. They took a symbol like which looks like a Greek letter, and they called it Vega. But it's not a true Greek letter. Okay, so the Vega of an option is the uh, variation of the derivative price with respect to its volatility. Okay, so Vega here, again we repeat, it's the variation of the option price with respect to the volatility parameter sigma. Okay, so this is the volatility of the underlying asset. Okay, again, uh, for for um, for the Black Scholes model, you can replace C by the closed form for, uh, closed form solution we identified earlier, and then through some some algebra again and just regular differentiation operations, you can find a value of sigma here so there are two ways two equivalent ways to express it either this expression or this expression here which is greater than zero so this means that uh, whenever sigma increases or the volatility increases on the markets the option values increase and the reason why this is true is that options uh, they only have uh, they can only have very high upside but the downside is uh, bounded below by zero. So if the volatility increases a lot, you have very high prospects for very high payoffs, but uh, you will never have a payoff lower than zero. So this is why when you hold an option, it's advantageous to have high volatility on the market. Furthermore, the Vega, again, it's the same for a put option and a call option. Okay, so this is... Uh, uh, an interesting result. Finally, another Greek letter is the Psi. So this one is is not as frequently uh, encountered in practice, and one reason might be because uh, dividends. Although we use continuous dividends in this chapter, in practice they are always discrete. Okay, so it's a bit uh, harder to implement that. Psi in practice because of the mismatch between assumptions of this model and what happens in real life. Okay, but you can still do in theory differentiate the value of an option price with respect to the dividend yield. And you can, if you just plug in the Black Scholes formula for C, you can make some differentiation and obtain the following uh, formulas for the psi of an option. Okay, so these were uh, partial derivatives with respect to option prices. Uh, with with respect, sorry, partial derivatives of option prices with respect to uh, values of the inputs of the formula. But in practice, sometimes uh, a normalized version of the Greeks is reported instead of the Greeks themselves. Okay. So uh, in practice, for example, rho and vega, so this is the partial uh, derivative with respect to the risk-free rate, partial derivative with respect to the volatility. They are often expressed as the derivative price variation for a 1% or a 100 uh, 
basis points, variation of respectively the risk free rate or the volatility. Okay, so why is that the case? It's because partial derivative, it's the variation of the price for a variation of one of the risk free rate, for example. But a variation of one of the risk free rate is a variation of 100%. So it means, for example, it's the variation when the risk free rate goes from 3% to 103%. Okay, so this variation uh, is much too large in practice. So typically, people would like to know what happens if the risk free rate goes from 3% to 4% instead of 3% to 103%. Okay, so for that reason, they apply a scaling factor for some of the Greek letters. So they, they divide the Greeks by 100 for the Vega and the Rho. Okay, so here Vega star is the scale version of the Vega, which is the Vega parameter divided by 100. Rho star is the scale version of the rho, which is the rho divided by 100. And the divide by 100 factor here, it's to uh, obtain a variation of 1% instead of a variation of 100% of the uh, underlying factor, okay, the pricing factor. Same thing here, um, theta. So here T, the, the time to maturity, in the formula, it's often uh, reported as one year, okay? But what banks are or other institutions are typically interested in, it's not a variation over, over the course of one year. They often want a variation over the course of one day, for example, okay? So um, uh, typically options have maturities which are uh, one month, two months, three months, something like that, okay? So you don't want to know. In one year, they won't exist anymore, okay? So for many of them, okay? So financial institutions, often they're interested in variations for one day instead of one year. So because of that, they take their initial Greek, which represents the variation of the option price as one year passes, and they divide by 365, to obtain the variation for one day instead of variation for one year. Okay, one final remark here. So uh, there, for some of the other Greeks, so for instance, for the Delta, uh, the Greeks are often normalized when they're reported, but this time there's there can be other ways to normalize them. So instead of uh, considering a variation of $1 of the underlying asset, we could in instead consider a variation of 1% of the value of the underlying asset. Okay, so let's say the underlying asset is uh, $1,000 or $2,000. So instead of considering what happens if there's a variation of $1 of the underlying asset, we might say, okay, what happens if there's a 1% variation of the underlying asset value, which is an increase by $20, okay? So to represent that uh, outcome, the again, the scaling factor, some scaling factor is applied to the original delta. So here, delta star uh, is a scaling factor times the original delta, where here the scaling factor is S divided by 100, which is 1% of the value of the stock. Okay, so sometimes if you're interested um, on, uh, uh, on variation of the option for relative shocks on values of the input instead of absolute shocks, then you can apply some scaling factor which represent, for instance, 1% of the variation of the underlying asset. So this is another way to uh, represent Greeks. All right, so we are gonna stop this video here. In the final video associated with this chapter, we're gonna uh, discuss some more risk management concepts. So thank you, have a nice day.